All right, everyone, I would like to welcome you. My name is Rob Wright, and I'd like to welcome you to the Able Muse uh, la launch of the Able Muse uh, 30th edition of the Able Muse Review of Poetry, Prose, and Art for the winter of 2022 2023. I'm glad you could join us this afternoon and hear our contributors and prize winners read their outstanding work. In a moment, I'll introduce you to Alex Peppel founder and editor of Able Muse Press and World Galaxy Press, as well as the Eratosphere online workshop. But first, I'd like to share a message he received recently from David Lehman, editor, the Oxford Book of American Poetry and series editor of Best American Poetry. This is a fan letter in appreciation of the winter 2022-2023 issue of the Able Muse Review. I especially enjoy the interview with Mary Jo Salter and her poems, but many of the other poems are admirable and your hospitality to poetic form and traditional elements of prosody and rhyme is impressive and to me heartwarming. The review of books by Mr. Brown and Drylick was another highlight. My best wishes to you, to Mr. Pe Mr. Pepple and Stephen Campa, David Lehman. Kudos indeed. And now, Alexander Pepple. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for that. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. So that, yes, that was a very heartwarming uh, message from uh, David Lehman, uh, who, uh, as you know, uh, is the main editor for the Best American Poetry. And uh, it's good to see all of you here today. And uh, it's wonderful that uh, your contributions resulted in this. This is the, the issue we're going to be reading from the new uh, and latest issue of Able News. So uh, it was, it's almost like it, it wasn't that long ago that uh, we met for the last Zoom session of last year. And here we are again, <laughs> ready to kick, kick things up for the new year. And uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Rob take over and uh, get us going. Thank you, Rob. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Alex. And um, before we get begin the program, I'd like to say how I'd like to proceed. After we begin, I'll mute everyone except the reader. After each reader has finished, I'll ask them to give I'll ask the audience to give a silent applause. Then at the end of each section, fiction, poetry, and essay, we'll all unmute ourselves for general applause. The chat box will be open for comments and questions during the reading for discussion at the end of the readings. After the question and answer period, I'll ask the writers to share titles of their publications where they can be found. And please do not have one, more than one more device active during the readings, for instance, phone or computer, as this may cause echo and feedback. Okay, now I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, except the reader, make sure to unmute yourself. Uh, so, there we go. And the first reader is... Uh, Therese Co. Her writing has appeared in Able Muse, Agenda, Alaska Quarterly Review, Cincinnati Review, The Classical Outlook, Hawkins Review, Metamorphosis, The Moth, New American Writing, New Scot Scotland Writing, Plowshares, Poetry, Poetry Review, Three Penny Review, and the TLS. Her collection Shot Silk was shortlisted for the 2017 Poets Prize. Her dramatic comedy, Harry Smith at the Chelsea Hotel, was read by equity actors at Dixon Place in 2019. Therese. Thank you and congratulations to Alex, Rob, all the editors and all the people who are in the new um, Able Muse because that's quite a compliment from David Lehman. Quite, that's wonderful. Okay, so I am going to read from the story called Death on the Tracks, Machu Picchu to Cusco, Peru, which is based on a true story, but I embroidered it to some degree. So I'm, I'm just gonna give you a tiny little bit of information about where we are in the story now, because I'm not starting at the beginning and it's only five minutes, so I just hope nothing goes wrong in terms of my sound, but let me know if it does, okay? 
uh, okay, so we, uh, we're on a train, a, a, a couple hundred people are on the train returning from Machu Picchu to Cusco. And we are now stranded in high in the Andes jungle on a mountainside over the Urubamba River, which is a raging massive river because the train hit a Peruvian on the tracks and killed him. It was said he was a drunk, but no one really knew. The corpse is assumed to be under the wheels. The engineer and the conductor have vanished and the engine is still running, but the train is standing still. So people are talking in the car that I'm in. No water on board, no food, darkest nightfall outside, and a most alarming shortage of cigarettes, said Paul. I added, the lights are dimming, there's no moon. It's getting very cold at 10,000 feet or so. The other passengers had no coats or blankets. A Frenchman brightened. I saw a river out there. I'm sure there's water in the river. Even Arthur could not accept this silently. I'm sure there is, but there was no river the first hour out of Cusco, so we're farther from Cusco than we thought. Are you planning to ford it tonight? That was too much for me as well. Ford it? It's the swollen Urubamba. I doubt there's a place to swim it. Never mind ford it. A Dane walked into our car inquiring in English as to whether we could possibly tell him what had happened. Paul accommodated him with typical patience. He explained the conductor and engineer have disappeared, possibly to find a judge, and nothing could be done in the meantime. The Dane said, oh yes, they have a Guardia Civil. It will have to be an extensive rescue mission. That should add another few days to our wait. I managed not caring how pathetic it sounded anymore. Why would a judge live in a village without a road? Someone asked. He probably has to come from Arequipa, I said. If not Lima, sighed Paul and paused. Well, at least we've seen Machu Picchu. Arthur looked up from his postcard. How could I possibly have finished writing out all of my postcards when I write so slowly? A man stepped out into the night, then returned. I've been out there 50 times and it's always the same. Well, at least you're not getting bored, his child retorted. Then the boy's older sister intoned weirdly, well, the lights are getting dimmer and dimmer. At least they won't go off till they get dimmer. At this, Paul stuck his head out the window and shouted to the Spanish Trans River communicators in other cars, while you're bartering, how about getting us some decent biscuits? How these would be transported across the river was a subject left unexplored. Arthur smiled and murmured, the people are gathering from hamlet to hamlet. Across the river that we had seen some children and that was like news to us. But how could any village at this altitude with so few lights have a telephone, I asked. Paul brightened, oh yes, evidently that village is famous even in England for it has the best restaurant in all of Peru and it seats exactly 250 people. Someone else threatened, wait till my tour guide hears about this. More children had now arrived across the river. I marveled that among mountain people, it always seemed to be the children who knew what was going on first. They've come to witness the magnificent spectacle of a train full of stranded gringos, just sitting there on a mountain as their lights become dimmer and dimmer, craving food and warmth. Arthur was half asleep, but mumbled, oh, perhaps the judge is here. Immediately, the word was passed down the line as nearby travelers swept up the information. I informed Arthur, your rumor has been accepted unequivocally and will soon reach the French car. Oh, wonderful, pass it on, cried Paul. Yes, this is the perfect source for rumors. 
tell them the whole village is here, I added. But not the right person, said Paul. Oh, look, now cars are here. They're shining their headlights across the water at us. Yes, that's promising, said Paul. Tis, tisn't it, Arthur concurred without opening his eyes. Those are the richer townsfolk come to gape at us in their cars. How are we going to get across the river? But this means there's a road, said the Australian woman excitedly. The car is facing this way. Could be a zombie, the five-year-old joined in, sounding frightened. We're surrounded, Paul decided. They're building a great bonfire. An American grumbled. They think it's very funny. He meant the Peruvian children, but no doubt several adults in our car as well. Thank you, Therese, very much. Uh, it was wonderful reading. Um, and Thank uh, you. Uh, now I would like to introduce L.M. Brown, uh, who grew up in Sligo, Ireland. Most of her 20s were spent backpacking in Southeast Asia, New Zealand, and South America, looking for stories only to set most of them in her home county. Her two short story collections were featured in World Literature Day, she has won the Abel Muse Prize for Fiction twice, been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and shortlisted in various other awards, including the Eric Hoffer Award for her novel, Hinterland, Formite, 2020. And now I'd like to bring you, I'd like to present you with Ellen Brown. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Um, so Rob, I'm correct in saying you wanted me to read the whole piece. Yes, you were the prize winner, so you get to read the whole piece. Okay. Tyke slid his wet hands down the back of his head. Anna was better at this. After their first kiss in the hay shed, she plucked the straw from his hair and with her hand, with her tongue, flattened the air in strands. He wasn't sure where she was now, but an ease stopped him from calling out. There was a chance he had visitors and had been sent to the bathroom to clean up. Make yourself presentable, his mother would often say on Sunday mornings when they were getting ready for mass. The other days of the week, there was no thought about presentation. And no matter how much he scrubbed, he couldn't get the coal dust out of his pores. He heard the opening and closing of cupboards in the kitchen. Anna never made that much noise. She was sprightly full of energy and light on her feet. When they'd cycled five miles to their first dance in Kiju, he hadn't been able to keep up with her. She'd worn a new dress and Ty had been conscious of the grime under his nails and the dusky streak of soot that would not be washed off his shirt collar. It had been easier to tell Anna of the breathlessness he'd felt when he was away from the mountain and the keen-faced younger boys who'd waited for the miners to come home in the evening. Tyke had been among them once, excited for the day he could join his father on the truck. You can't work there, she'd said. Her eyes had been bright from the dancing. There was a knock on the bathroom door. Dad, are you okay? He clung to the sink for support. His reflection threw back his father's face. He had the same long chin, but a full head of gray hair. Dad, I'm grand, he said. I'm going next door. No one's answering the bloody phone. Okay, he said, though he had a feeling she was already gone by the time he managed to answer. There was no one in the bedroom. Boxes were piled at the end of the bed. He recognized Anna's good dresses folded in one and felt a pain low in his belly with the different shades of blue and green. She never liked any other colors against her skin. She thought the pink uniform she had to wear for the diner drained all color from her cheeks. In the living room, the photographs of their girls had were taken down to leave patches in the wall. The younger Sinead took after Ty, while the elder, Rose, had Anna's light colouring. The Rose was taller and broader and had none of her mother's grace. Still, she was the one who tried ballet. There were no vote videos in any of the boxes he looked in. Anna always closed the curtains to watch the recordings of their daughter in the ballet garb. 
She'd make sure to get to the recitals early while Ty fitted wires in strange kitchens. When he first got to the country and was training with the electric company, he'd often pause to look out dirt street windows and think of his father in the coal mine with nothing but the carbide lamp for light. He couldn't remember what they were called now, the men who brought the coal out in wagons. Outside, the snow was piling up. A silent mass of white drops climbed on the window. Their first snowstorm, Anna was working in the diner. She was like a child standing outside the door in her flimsy shoes with the snow falling around her. That wasn't me, Rose said. It was Sinead's one, Mary. She's still dancing, but it's not ballet anymore. It hasn't been for ages. What's it called again, he said. A tutu. I can't believe you're asking me that. Rose was still angry at him for unpacking the box. She cleaned it up while he'd made her tea. Anna loved her tea strong. Every Sunday, they'd go as far as South Boston to the Irish shops for the groceries and then rush home to cook the fry up together. Anna hummed while she cooked and swayed her hips. She, she could mem mesmerize him. Diane will be over later, Rose said. Are you sure you'll be okay? all right? I'll be back early tomorrow with Sinead. Ty nodded. Rose picked up a sandwich. Her fingers were chubby. Her nails were painted pink from one at diamond sparkled. You used to have terrible fits about the cross, Ty said. I did not. You did. I don't know where you first saw them cut off, but you wanted your mother to make the sandwiches like that, he chuckled. She'd never do that. You used to scream something awful. Rose was watching him now in a way he didn't like, sad but also wary, and it thought, he thought it was from the mention of Anna. Her absence brought a heavy sadness. He wanted to ask her if she told the daughters about the mine rats. One day, while he was fitting wires in another house, she might have said that the vermin were fed by the crusts of bread. The men weren't supposed to drop any food while they worked, but there was no eating the crusts when their hands were black from coal. He couldn't remember if this was why Anna had refused to cut them, no matter how much Rose cried, or if it was plain stubbornness. It could have been Sinead, Rose said. She gets things like that into her head. She hasn't eaten meat in a year. You'd think the Thanksgiving gravy was made to poison her. She likes your mother's gravy. Dad, he looked away from her. The porch looks fit to fall, he said. It's lasted this long, she said. For a while, there'd been a raised bed in the backyard. Anna had been success successful with tomatoes and lettuce. When Tyg's mother came over after his father was killed, she had asked why there was no rhubarb. I th thought it could grow anywhere. It's like a weed at home, she'd said. Drawers, he remembered now. They were the ones who took the coal out on wagons. Other men replaced the shoveled coal with slate and wood to keep the roof up. Brushes. What, Rose said? That's what they were called. Arigna bullets were the rocks that killed his father, but he kept that to himself. Rose's jacket was thrown over the chair. His bag was a big, her bag was a big black yoke that would have been wide enough to hold the kitchen sink. For months, it had been filled with brochures featuring the residential homes she wanted him to see. She and the Chinave had decided on one an hour away and close to Rose's house. And so, the packed boxes. The fact hit him with renewed force. Rose was telling him about the barber who took care of the residents once a week. Instinctively, his hand went to his hair. He was surprised to feel his head was wet. You'll be looking dapper, she said. And he wondered where she came up with that word and decided he hated it. His father would have hated it too. Rose followed his gaze to the sacred heart hanging by the kitchen door. In the dimming light, the heart looked like a rose blooming from Christ's chest. I'll pack that tomorrow after I collect Sinead, she said. They'll have it hung on your new, they'll have it hung up in your new room in no time. Ty nodded and remembered a sacred heart had hung up was hung up by the pit entrance. With the darkness creeping toward him, it had seemed as if it was his own red and throbbing heart that had been exposed. The sandwiches were wrapped in cling film and put in the fridge. The plates were drying on the draining board. The snow was a white haze in the dwindling night when the doorbell rang. Diane, a smiling thin woman, stood before Ty. She looked nothing like Anna, but he was reminded of her waiting outside the diner with the snow drifting around her. It's okay, I have sandwiches, he said with a sudden impatience. 
The street lights were yellow blurs, coal seeped into his pants. He could hear his own breathing. It was hard to see now, but he knew to turn left. His legs were numb by the time he reached the bridge. The shortcut was by the water. He had to wade through the snow. The first time he staggered, he managed to right himself. The second time, he was by the frozen stream and the blanket of snow was surprisingly warm. He was so tired, just a few minutes, and then he'd carry Anna home on his back. Their first snowstorm, her arms were around his neck, and she'd kept her face towards the snow that looked too tired in his last moments like falling stars. Thank you so much, um, Lorna L.M. Brown. Beautiful reading, really. Um, just fantastic and lovely story. Um, okay, moving along. R.S. Powers is and will be. Their fiction has been published in Glimmer Train, Sal Wester, Grist, Entropy, JMWW, Jute, and Abel Muse. They currently teach writing to wide-eyed, world-weary undergrads approximately 856 miles from the unincorporated community of Abel, Mississippi, and 1,306 miles from the unincorporated community of Muse, Oklahoma. So please uh, take it away. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a really roundabout way of saying I'm in Pennsylvania somewhere right now. I uh, just moved here recently. Uh, that I just want to thank everyone for uh, taking time out to appreciate um, all these other great readers. Uh, this is this is amazing to be a part of this. Um, uh, I, I'm going to I copied and pasted the link to my story and I put it in the chat in case you want to follow along. If there's anything that's I, I've come to sort of grapple with the idea that my fiction tends to have too many characters in it. So if it becomes difficult to follow, it's, it might be easier to follow along that way. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to read the, just the beginning of the story uh, that's just in this great new issue of Able Muse. Um, I'll say that uh, it's set, you know, around the year 2006 or seven or so. Um, at this point, it's almost historical fiction. It's set in uh, Beijing in China among a community of uh, mostly American, mostly Anglo uh, expats. Um, I'll say that uh, this first person voice. This is fiction. Uh, I think when I was trying to write this, I aimed for a, to sort of incorporate a lot of, um, let's just say that this, this is the, the, the voice of someone who's had some very unique formative experiences before becoming an expat and has uh, made uh, not always the right decision and sort of what to learn from those formative experiences. Um, so this is, a, everyone I know is a terrible person. I'd been at Dreamboat English for maybe half a year on a really bad two-year contract when I was named King Teacher. This was in Beijing a few summers before the 2008 Olympics, when it was easier for a nobody to find their way into the country. They had already named Mr. Clean as the new king, but then something apparently went wrong with the business license and police started doing visa checks and Mr. Clean left and panic spread since all foreign teachers lived in the same high rise. When the air was good, I could see out my window from some 20 stories up, the new subway line being built all day and night. The tourist visa hires pulled runners to avoid deportation. Threats were made to keep the passports of all work visa hires in a safe so we too uh, wouldn't leave. Then our monthly pay was cut to help fix the apparent license problem. So everyone fled except for Mr. Lies, Miss Porn, and me, Mr. Loser. Rumor was the police were looking for someone. Meanwhile, I thought I was in love. I was also still religiously Googling my new legal name and was, under, uh, and was no longer in touch with anyone back home and starting to think my few years away from undergrad would become a decade. When I could find sleep, I'd get stuck in sci-fi dreams about a bright orange sandstorm that would slowly bury me along with the capital's 15 plus million people. I was thrilled about my sudden coronation. Mrs. Many Audis, Dreamboat's founder, who dressed like she ran a Fortune 500 company with a bouffant like a lion's mane, had her two young overworked assistants, Mr. Overly Fluent and Miss Overly Qualified, bring me down one floor to her smoky office at midnight, six hours before I had to catch a charter bus for my newest teaching assignment 
on a far-flung campus that during the 70s had been a cement brick-making commune. From behind her faux marble desk, she told me, through Mr. Overly Fluent, why Mr. Serious Anger Issues, Dreamboat's first hire and original King Teacher, a title I'd learned was his idea, was returning to Arizona. Something about how the ear acupuncture he'd been doing to treat his increasingly morbid weight problem wasn't working. In the resignation email they showed me, he'd also provided a more typical lie. A mess of relatives back home had, quote, stage five brain cancer. She saw my smirk and assured me through Mr. Overly Fluent, his exodus lacks relevance to our constabulary entanglement. Don't worry, be happy, the show must go on. In a few days, I'd run an orientation for at least a dozen new tourist visa hires, giving the same spiel that had promised me flexible hours, airfare reimbursement, and more. And I'd cover Mr. Serious Anger Issues' as section at the far-flung dusty campus the next morning, meaning another 20 high schoolers would be in my sunny classroom with a broken AC unit. I'd get a new business card and have my photo featured on a website they were building. Did I know anything about web design? Could I complete a website someone else started? No, 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 I said about the website. Are you excited? Mrs. Many Audis beamed in sudden English. I don't know what to say, I said. Congratulations, Mr. Overly Fluent said, standing to shake my hand. You'll do very well, Miss Overly Qualified said, giving me a thumbs up. Yes, yeah, I said in my awful Chinese. Thank you, but why me? I didn't mean to ask that, it just came out. I mean, I'm glad, I said, honored, you won't regret it. Mr. Lee, uh, Mr. Overly Fluent translated and everyone returned to their smiling. You are not our primary choice, Mrs. Many Audi said through Mr. Overly Fluent, but you are the most incomparable choice. She ended the meeting by reciting Dreamboat's slogan, are you ready to revolutionize education? Yes, I said, yes. They knew I was a terrible teacher. I didn't plan, I overslept. Nothing would have made Mr. Lies happier than being made a king of something. I knew he'd flip out about not getting the job. Miss Porns sh should have gotten it. Before I left my room for my coronation, she was half looking online for a new teaching gig she said would take us to a new part of China and half composing her version of a resignation email. Are you Catholic, she said. She was on her laptop in my bed. No, I said, washing my face. So it would be weird, she said, if I wrote we're taking a sabbatical to go on the way of St. James pilgrimage. They were lucky to have her. She grew up in a not nice, her words, trailer park in a part of Michigan indistinguishable from Siberia, also her words, to parents that threw plates at one another even after signing divorce papers in the parking lot of her high school graduation. She told me it was always left to her to change the diapers of her big and simple, her words again, half brother, 10 years her senior, and still she won a full ride to a big state school, finishing with degrees in literature and Spanish with a minor in philosophy. I told her I'd never heard her speak Spanish, so she threw off the comforter, model walked to the desk, downloaded her 20-page honors thesis, written in Spanish, and read from it as she paced my room in the nude. When I returned after my coronation, the lights were out and she was asleep. The air was particularly bad, so my view toward the heart of Beijing was an ashen void punctuated by the dull orange specters of nearby streetlights. I undressed and slipped into bed. They fire you before you could quit, she mumbled into her pillow. They told me why anger issues left, I said. They made me king. You won the booby prize, she said, her eyes still closed. It's going to be a lot of work, I said, but I think I'm ready. I wanted her to be proud of me. Aye, aye, Mr. King, loser booby prize, she said, turned over and fell asleep again. It was her idea to give everyone at Dreamboat nicknames only we knew. I was her Mr. Lovable Loser after drunkenly proclaiming at an expat bar that only losers end up in China teaching English which became Mr. Loser after I kept losing my passport whenever the police showed up to do their check. While the two bored, uh, two bored looking young female cops that watched me rifle through piles of clothes and messy drawers, she'd stand in my doorframe and barely contain her laughter. She was already almost fluent, so I could only guess at what she was telling them. And I'll go ahead and stop there. So thank you very much. And thank you, RS. Uh, it was a great story and um... And now um, we will go to, um, uh, this is a time when we um, speak of uh, our featured poet and an interview for which there was an interview, Mary Jo Salter. Unfortunately, Mary Jo can't be with us today, but um, we do have Sally Thomas, an associate 
editor for um, Able Muse reading uh, three of her poems. But let me tell you something about Mary Jo uh, Salter. She was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, educated at Harvard and Cambridge, has held editorial positions at the Atlantic and the New Republic. She was the editor of both the collected and selected poems of Amy Clampett and has co-edited three editions of the Norton Anthology of Poetry, 1996, 2005, and 2018. She taught at Mount Holyoke and Johns Hopkins before retiring as the Krieger Eisenhower Professor. Her most recent of nine volumes of poetry, all published by Kanaf, is Zoom Rooms. Her second children's book, Lena Learning to Talk, will appear in 2024. And uh, Sally Thomas uh, is the author of a poetry collection, Motherland, two poetry chapbooks, and he's the associate poetry editor for New York Sun. She's also co-edited the anthology Christian Poetry in America since 1940, and is the author of the novel Mer Works of Mercy. So please welcome Mary Jo Salter. Uh, I'm sorry. For reading for Mary Jo Salter, Sally Thomas. <laughs> Right, yes, I'm, I'm not Mary Jo Salter, but I'm gonna read three of her poems and I don't know what remarks she would have made to preface these poems, but I'm just gonna give you the poems because I think they're pretty self-explanatory. The first one is Concerto Number no. One for Hearing Aids. Walking out of the doctors, floorboards creaking, squeaking rubber soles, then rough McAdam, parking lot pebbled, evidently newly, the crunch of crumpled papers in her purse until she found by feel the key ring, lifted, jingle bells, wow, a whole percussion session, section, pressing the fob, the door lock pop, ear popping, slammed the door, shut, not meaning to, said sorry to nobody but herself, said, stuff again, to hear that person talking loudly, tinny, hollow, but tinny, and what a fuss budget, dotting the I, crossing the T, enunciating as if her listener were some sort of dimwit, herself then turned the key in the ignition, and the radio was on and violins on the classical station, violins were treble, and how long had music Things been out of whack, too much bass, too muffled dark and sorry. Treble was young. Treble was what she'd had when she couldn't hear yet what the world would sound like being old, a new thought. Think of that. This next poem is The Mailman. Here comes the mailman. I mean the letter carrier. The gendered term was neutered by some clever ad person with one foot in anachronism since nobody writes letters. And yet our mailman is a living panting exemplar of hard copy, large as a mountain climbing another mountain as he heaves himself up our uneven stone front steps and jams the environmentally unfriendly, unwanted catalogs into the slot, all the time talking loud. That's what I'm saying, he's saying. The earbuds nestled in his ears, listen and nod. I've always wondered who's in there, his wife, his brother, a few good friends on call, perpetually to murmur the things you say to someone fired up all day, when he had COVID for two months during lockdown, almost died, his mild replacement told us. I felt sorry I'd never asked his name. His name is Kevin. And if he spots me through the window, always smiles and waves, though he can't stop to talk, to me that is, he's otherwise engaged. That's what I'm saying. He and I are persons, almost outdated, not quite finished saying whatever it is, some burning, urgent thing. This last poem is called Reflections. There he was, 
or in any case, an image on my laptop of his real time self five hours later in England, but also here and now peering at us from his computer screen and about to bend his head to an unseen novel on his desk to read aloud to a virtual audience of writers, many of whom had struggled that same day to conjure at our screens a thing that's true about living in words true as we could find, a few scenes from atonement. I had read it twice before, had seen the movie, now in a live stream of a graying mild man reading his novel with commentary, I heard him say that the headstrong teenaged writer, Bryony, who in the book would spend her life to come atoning for one grievous wrong by writing this book itself, one with a happy ending that unhappily was all made up, was not always meant by him to be the author. It came to him midway, part of the process. Ghost writer, that's what he'd become and even willed for himself to appear to disappear. Or that's what I was thinking at the moment 50 minutes in when finally I saw what had been mirrored all along within the night sky framed behind his head. Our heads like moons confined to bluish squares. His monitor's reflection in the window blocked partly by the shadow of the body who sat before it, proved I was in England, gazing at me here, however blurry, infinite fictions, yet time for only one last question. Mr. McEwen, someone asks, what do you think you've learned of what it means to be sorry, to atone? A thoughtful answer emerges, touching on Henry James, James Joyce, the examined life, you can't call back the deeds, the author says, and pious self-forgiveness, he tends to think, is too easy a way out. He pauses, offer a, offers a smile that reads as rueful. All you can do is contemplate, reflect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally, so much. I. Um... Now invite everyone to unmute themselves for applause for our readers, for uh, Therese uh, Co, L.M. Brown, R.S. Powers, and reading for Mary Jo Salter, uh, uh, Sally. Terrific. Terrific. Very nice. Terrific. Very nice. And, and I would invite everyone to uh, to to look at the uh, to to read if you haven't uh, the the interview with uh, Mary Jo Salter by uh, Stephen Campa, in which uh, he talks about her her writing process, uh, her engagement with languages from the places that she has lived, and her translations. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, very informed, and of course. You know, she's had a wonderful career as a writer. I would like to uh, take a five minute break now since this is gonna be a long reading. And when we return, we'll be uh, uh, doing the, the poets and then finishing with uh, the essay by, um, by Michael Hedge. So um, just five minutes if you would, and I'll see you then. All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, we're now going to the uh, poetry section, uh, which of course is uh, Abel Muse is famous for. Uh, and we're going to start out with uh, Dan Bourne's translation of Natural Selection is one of the Polish poet Tadeusz Danowski's acerbic and political eight line poems. Uh, Danowski from Gdansk published his first book of poetry, 17,000 Monkey Tales, in 2009, and his poetry reviews and translation from English appear regularly in the Polish literary journal Toposh. Translator Daniel Bourne's forthcoming books of poetry, uh, poetry collection, Talking Back to the Exterminator, Regal House, and translations of the Pol Polish poet Branisław Mai, Extinction of the Holy City, Parlor Press, a free press, free verse editions. And I'm welcome, Daniel. 
All right. Thank you so much for um, putting this all together, uh, Alex and Rob and, and the rest of you at, at Able Muse. Um, here, I'm, I'm actually a voice representing another voice, uh, that of Tadeusz Jevanovsky, uh, who I was hoping would listen in from Gdańsk, but it's at least 10 o'clock there right now. And uh, uh, he might be off to bed or off to something else at this point. Um, so this is a, a, a translation uh, of one of uh, Jevanovsky's octets. They're all eight lines. And I won't read the original Polish, but but in Polish, the title would be Dobur Naturalne, or Natural Selection. After the elimination of all worthless specimens, there arose at last a species, a species able to feed on empty packages of potato chips that gladly watched ads about hemorrhoid creams and transmissions of the latest riots on Mars. This species loved to take walks with its neighbor on a leash and learn to reproduce by liking on Facebook. It fell in love with both gorgeous pixels in the morning smog. Luckily, God never got involved. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry if I butchered the Polish there. Um, okay. Brian Campbell is next, and his writings appeared in Dark Horse, painted by, painted by Quarterly, and the anthology 14 Younger Poets. His chapbook, Across the Creek, is available from Penn and Anvil Press. Blake, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, and thank you to Alex um, for putting together this wonderful issue. I'm very honored to be reading with everybody today. Um, so the poem that I have in the issue is called um, Numinous Rooms, and it's an ekphrastic poem um, based on a painting called The Numinous Room, um, which was done by the Salem artist Quentin Oliver Jones, um, who used to live in the house where I currently reside. So I'm going to share my um, screen. All right, excellent. Um, I could just figure out what I did with the picture. Um, all right, here's the painting. Numinous rooms. The wind surrounds us, taking stock of all that goes unseen, unsaid, in white rooms where the living walk, and blue rooms peopled by the dead. Two realms, two houses intersect. The lines between them dissipate, reflecting what they recollect, but struggling to get it straight. Men dead for decades reappear. In lines the living blur and blot until it is no longer clear who's really here and who is not. Who's ghost, who's guest, who's resident? An open house without a close admits the things it underwent until the present overflows. The breath of those who came before still fogs the pains and pricks the skin. We take their steps across the floor, not knowing where their feet have been. For history, none would deny, is by its nature incomplete. No chronicler can tell us why the fire spared this stretch of street. And if the victors write it down and shape the present with their pens, Future reads the past's renown as through a cracked and clouded lens. And we are scrutinized in turn by those who watch us from the blue, the dead who seldom do return to rearrange the world they knew. Although they show themselves at times in flickers or the smell of bread, or when the family china chimes beneath the phantom's heavy tread, they soon withdraw, their faces fray 
like faces etched in windswept sand, were wisps in cloudscapes blown away by one exacting painter's hand. Nice. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful. Nice. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, and um, now um, we will move to, um, let's see, Jay Ragoff, Rogoff, excuse me. Um, Jay lives in Saratoga Springs, New York, and has published seven books of poetry, most recently, Loving in Truth, New and Selected Poems. In November, um, uh, LSU Press will publish his book of criticism, Becoming Poetry, Poets and Their Methods. So please welcome Jay. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob and Alex, for uh, putting this together. It's good to be in such good company. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is from the issue, Averted Vision. Uh, it's a villanelle. Uh, it has something to do with how we see and how we don't see. Uh, as you know, a, vill a villanelle has two refrains, and so it's always nice when one comes to you as a gift. Uh, this one came to me from uh, the epigraph that I have for the poem, which is by the science writer Timothy Ferris. Uh, also, somehow in the poem, uh, Titian's painting The Venus of Urbino gets into it. Uh, uh, don't ask me how. Uh, averted vision. Here's the epigraph. Peering with one eye through a telescope at the night sky, dim things disappear if you look right at them. Deep space observers combat this effect by employing averted vision, meaning that they look slightly away from the objects of their attention. Averted vision is the deepest vision. Averted vision. Averted vision is the deepest vision. We're blinded where the retina strikes a nerve. Believing all you see is superstition. Since gazing at raw bodies risks derision, sneak barest peaks, letting your eye beams swerve. Averted vision is the deepest vision, the coyly carnal stare cooked up for Titian, whose naked Venus throws you a naked curve, believe you me. See, no superstition restrains her fingers in manual transmission, whipping desire from virginal reserve. She averts her vision, but her deepest vision sees through foreplay to the firm collision of flesh and no flesh. Students observe. Believing all you see is superstition inserts you in the forefront of tradition, where smiling nudes mature into chef d'oeuvre. Averted vision is the deepest vision. Believing all you see is superstition. Nice. Nice. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Jay, wonderful. Ryan Brodeur is the author of poetry collections, of four poetry collections, most recently, Some Problems with Autobiography, 2023, which won the 2022 New Criterion Prize. His poems and literary criticism can be found in Hopkins Review, Literary Matters, Los Angeles Review of Books, The New Criterion, and The Writer's Chronicle. Ryan lives with his wife and daughter in the White River uh, Valley. He teaches at Indiana University East. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Alex. It's really great to be here with so many talented writers. Um, great company. Uh, I am certainly among great company in this issue. So, uh, so thanks. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the poem from Abel Muse, and uh, I don't think it requires any explanation. But it does start with a head note, which just gives the location of the poem, which is Bass River. South Yarmouth, Massachusetts, on the Cape, if anyone knows it. On mistaking a stranger for a dead friend, where dozens of egrets feast on their own reflection, late streaks of sun strike a surf caster's face. As he tries, as he ties a jig lure, I squint into the glare. We'd fish this marsh as kids for perch we called kiver. A gang of us upriver, stomping swamp orchids along a tidal island of storm-washed sand. 
In mud boots, I'd hike ahead to scout a decent spot on the crook of a silty spit. Stumbling from a trailhead, my friend, always last, would swear he hadn't been lost. I woke once to his voice, his boy's voice calling still. I leaned against the sill, the window glazed with ice, dripping condensation, and shut my eyes to listen. Now, two egrets close the kinked parenthesis, sorry, the kinked parentheses of their necks, a damp breeze sticking to my clothes. Low tides sulfur reek, fouls the estuary. My friend's father, I learned, found him in his apartment. The father, who'd only meant to stop by on an errand, folded the typed note and tried to untie the knot. Shouldn't egret share a root with regret? Seam with seam? Swells at tide line, gleam, frothing algae rot. Though it urges hush, the surf will not keep quiet itself. One stalking egret weaves through planks of an old pier. Then a juvenile pair wades into grinding waves that a last piling greets. The beach crowds with regrets. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful reading. Wonderful reading, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, and now um, I'm going to welcome David Wheelock, whose immersion in, immersion in writing poetry is relatively recent. His lifelong career has been as a composer of chamber vocal and orchestral music. His poems have appeared or will appear in Think, Ekphrastic, Alabama Literary Review, Blue Unicorn. Kelsey Books has released his first full-length book of poems, It's Hard Enough to Fly, last fall. So please welcome uh, uh, David Wheelock. Well, <clears throat> I thank you, Rob, and I... Uh, Thank you, Alex, as well. And uh, I would like to make a small correction, and that is that you've introduced me uh, with my brother's name. And uh, I'm Don Wheelock, and David is my brother. But I'm sure you'd be glad to have written my poetry. I am so Maybe sorry. Maybe not. It's all right. Um, I, I also would like to say that I have enjoyed... Um, Abel Muse readings. I've uh, gone to them several times, and I'm honored to be um, represented in this reading today. My poem is Crow's Nest. From the window of the room upstairs, the men among the branches bring to mind the sailors in the rigging where they bind the topsail to the yard. They work in pairs, one with a chainsaw dangling from a line, the other on the ground to trim the sheet and let the severed limb ease to the street. All day, high work and halyards intertwine. Thank you so much, Donald, and a thousand apologies. <laughs> All right. My you'd, be surprised, you'd be surprised how often that happens. Okay. My error completely. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. And we're moving on to Timothy Kleiser, teaches literature and philosophy at a liberal arts college in Kentucky. He speaks, speaks and writes often about placemaking and place identity, and has written many poems on these themes, including the one he'll be reading today, Burying a Racehorse. So please welcome Timothy. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing all of your fine work. It's such an honor to be here among you. And I'm glad to read a poem about my beloved home state of Kentucky. This is a uh, pays homage to some of the many of the small horse farms that um, dot our state. 
Burying a Racehorse Beyond the vacant hoof-hewn trails, across the fields, upon the hillsides stretching like a wave above a sea of aftergrass, their shovels pierce and pitch the stony earth. With steady practice strokes, they toil to pull away the penny royal quilts, to rouse the crumbling limestone from its crider bed and make a paddock grave upon this spot. There won't be talk of fire, no matter what it costs and strain and sweat, no matter how the bigger farms may treat their dead. No flame should taste what's owed to earth, and so they dig. The horses here are born to strike the ground forevermore. So now this soil will be her saddle, these ancient stones her shoes, to race in penny royal silks of purple green. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful reading. Uh, wonderful. And uh, the next reader, our next reader is Natalie Staples, who earned a BA at Kenyon College and an MFA from the University of Oregon. Her work has appeared in, or, or is forthcoming in NPR, Literary Matters, BPR, Terrain.org, and Swim Every Day, or SWWIM Every Day. She also serves as poetry editor for the Northwest Review. So everyone, please welcome Natalie. Thank you so much, Rob and Alex, for having me. I'm honored to be in this company. I'm going to read my poem, Harvest Song, in the issue. The poem is in Ars Poetica, and I draw on my experiences working for a community sustained farm in Malvern, Pennsylvania called Rushton. Mm -hmm. Harvest Song. Begin with soft tomatoes tossed across a fallow field. The sleeping ground has use. From cloistered moss to grass, the catbirds sow their seed, are bound to no one but themselves. And cattle make their cloven prints. Begin with green, a flash of wing. Forsake beloved tasks delight of rote routine. And if you can't begin with empty space, begin beyond the field, a copse of pine and birch, someplace unseen and far away from yellow crops. Go where turquoise lichen clings to wood, a hundred scattered limbs. The bark unfurls a thing of girlhood, a birch becomes a boat, a question mark that floats across a pond. Begin like this, untethered, broad, and winged. Obey the heart, its coldest wish, toward a quiet bruise, a slow decay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now I'm going to ask everyone to unmute themselves for general applause for our poets before we move on to our essayist. And um, yeah, this is a great nice. stuff. Really nice work. Lovely work. work. Nice. Lovely work. Really yeah. nice. Very, very nice. And I'd, I'd, like to rec I'd like to remind everyone that the, um, and, uh, the submission for uh, Able News Write Prize for Poetry and Prose for Fiction is open as well as uh, the um, uh, our, uh, the book prize. Uh, and you can um, go to uh, the Able Muse website. Uh, it's on. It's in the chat box or um, it's easy to find. Uh, or if you need any other information, you can contact me or uh, Alex. Uh, and, uh, and I encourage you all to uh, submit. And, and if you have submitted before, Submit again, by all means. And now I would like to uh, welcome, I'm going to mute everyone. And, uh, and then, and then um, invite uh, Michael Hetch, uh, 
uh, to read. Michael Hetch has published a dozen book of poets, poetry, most recently, To Start an Orchard, 2019, and The Mica Mine, 2021. A new and selected volume is forthcoming this spring from Press 53. He lives with his family in Black Mountain, North Carolina. His website is michaelhetch.com, quite simple. So Michael, uh, please welcome Michael, and uh, the floor is yours. The first thing I wanted to say is um, my last name is pronounced Hedick, H-E-T-T-I-C-H. Hedick is the uh, pronunciation. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Alex. Uh, It's great to be here. It's an honor to read to you all. Um, I'm going to read my parts of my essay called uh, uh, Impressions and Collage. Uh, Writing essays isn't really my primary writing. so this is kind of a new thing for me and and reading um an essay is a little bit uh new and kind of fresh for me too uh not listening to the line breaks but listening to the to the sentences um but this essay actually works in a way like a lot of my poems do in that it has uh juxtapositions of moments in order to make a collage that hopefully carries some kind of larger thematic uh structure or meaning so uh without uh further ado I'll read it um I'll read some of it. Uh, I'm not going to give the numbers. It's written in numbers. I think I have eight or nine sections. Uh, I'm just going to read read this, some of the sections. So here we go. Impressions and collage. I'm in our neighborhood park watching a young woman at play with her baby. It's a spring afternoon. They are laughing at nothing, simply laughing at their own happiness. There are pigeons and older children, people reading off phones. A group of girls in the distance is dancing and laughing to a pop tune of many years ago. The grass is soggy and the day is growing cool. Now the woman picks up her little boy and starts to walk slowly home, carrying him all the way. I imagine she loves the weight of him, the sweet smell of his breath. She sings silly songs as they walk along, and he sings back, still laughing, still too young to form the words, though he appears to understand them all. They stop often to admire flowers and insects and pieces of glass, newspapers blowing down the street, bikes passing on the sidewalk. I imagine someone watches from an upstairs window, a lonely man who lives in a wheelchair. Somehow, without knowing it, they bless him as they pass. Our lives are superimposed over each other, another and another, and so on. Each of the superimposed lives, unaware of the others, lying across it like translucent tracing paper, palimpsest, or stained glass windows. A woman imagines walking all day along an old carriage road in the woods, dusky even at noon, then stepping out into sunlight and watching dragonflies rise up and hover over the long grasses, buzzing with bees, walking into that field, still squinting from the darkness, thinking of her parents and their parents and their parents' parents as far back as math might take her, which is thousands of years, to realize each of these lives is living still in her movements and gestures, the way she tosses her hair, her habit of nodding to emphasize a point. 10,000 years ago, someone else moved in almost exactly that way, and he passed himself down through a minor eternity to this moment where she stands at the window in the morning light, drying her hair in the sun. After we'd spoken about school and friends and nothing in particular, my mother turned away and took off her skirt and blouse. Then in her, in her girdle and bra, she opened her clothes closet, walked in, and closed the door behind her. I could hear children outside playing baseball or kickball, calling out happily to each other. I knew my father would be home soon, and I knew my brother and sister were home now, doing something together in the basement. So I watched the closet door and listened for any sounds that might come from that darkness. Eventually, I went over and opened it. No one was inside. It smelled of mothballs and freshly polished shoes. I heard my dad call, I'm home, as the front door opened. 
My mother called back from the kitchen, so I stepped into that closet myself just to see if I could find her in there, this other mother I was sure I'd seen because she'd waved at me and smiled as she turned away. Remembering that smile now, so many years later, makes me think of a woman on a train looking out and waving as the train pulls out. She wants to go wherever it will take her, as far away as possible, so she waves half-heartedly because she thinks she has to, and then she turns away. Is there anything, even air, that doesn't have a color? Is there anything, even silence, that doesn't make a sound? Of course not. Why then do we think of the end of life as a simple vanishing? Why not instead think of it as moving into a color we can't yet see, another kind of light, or an entry into perfect silence waiting to be sounded? I remember stories of blind people suddenly able to see, not knowing what they're looking at, confused and terrified by the ordinary objects of the world, those very objects they lived and interacted with when they were blind. It's a form of disruption that might remake the world or remake ourselves within that world in such a way that our little world and ourselves might be reborn or born for the first time since we gave ourselves to language. In another country, the fires burned for years. In some other country, the floods took all the houses. We were looking out the window, she says now through tears, and saw the wave approaching. It was singing as it moved. We're riding our bikes through a southern forest, 50 yards or so from a salt marsh, pines and vines and occasional hardwoods, when a bald eagle flies across the trail, close enough to brush us with its wings, then swoops up into a longleaf pine, cracking through the branches with his wings as he flies up through the canopy, landing there and glaring out, paying us no mind. We stand watching for a while and then we ride on, suddenly younger and lighter than we were. When we tell the ranger, she's nonchalant about it. There's a nest further on, she says. And so we ride there to see the huge, beautifully built tree house at the top of another pine, far larger than but similar in structure to the osprey nests we've seen in the Everglades. This one's been abandoned, and we wonder why, since we've learned that bald eagles have great nest fidelity. We learn, too, from looking at our phones, that eagles migrate, sometimes great distances, and we try to imagine these huge birds moving through the sky, higher, most likely, than anyone can see. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you very listening. much, Michael. Just fantastic. Wonderful. Wonderful. And now um, I'll ask you all to unmute and give it a, a nice uh, round of applause for Michael Hedich. Thank you. As our essayist. And I will. Very uh, nice. Very nice. I will um, then uh, open the floor for questions for our. For our writers, uh, you can either put it in the chat box or just put a hand up uh, or shout out. Um. Uh, can I ask Michael? Yeah. Um, I just, I, I love this essay. It's, it's gorgeous. The, you know, the, how personal it is and the images and, you know, it's just beautiful. I just, I just, what would like to know what made you decide to go in the essay rather than poem and what was it a decision that took a while or yeah 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 that's a good um i think um hmm, i th i'm not really sure to tell you the truth uh i just like i think i like the improvisation that um writing uh sentences gives and um i i, I did a about uh, 150 pages of essays like this one where I said, I'm going to write 10 pages of prose or maybe 15 pages of prose, just do it quickly and see what, what comes and then um, start to shape things that way. And that was just a, a kind of a liberating way to, um, to work. And I think another thing for me is that if I write essays for a while, then when I go back to poems, they, I think they sing with greater fluidity or tightness or 
something happens to the poems through out of the process of writing essays uh, for me. So, so do you think the prose gives you more freedom? Um, a different kind of freedom. I think uh, I like the freedom that a poem gives because of the constraints that it, it, that it forces us to work within. But I like the freedom that writing sentences and paragraphs gives in that, you know, it, it I, it's just oh, more easier in a way. It's it's easy. It seems easier, which makes it in some ways harder. But um, uh, yeah, it's freer in 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 a certain way to write prose, for me. Uh, okay. Thank you for the question. It's a, there's a question in the box, but before that, I'd like to to speak to Michael about one of the impressions I had, and that was from the title, uh, the insertion of the title, in the title, Collage. And when I was reading it, I was thinking of, I was educated in art history, and I used to go to look at Cubist paintings a lot yeah. because the teacher, and Juan Gris was one of the people I loved, and he has elements that overlay you're looking out, window, often looking out windows, and there are elements of newspapers, pieces of chair overlaid there. And I was, it struck how in your work, how how compelling you made that that sense of the overlay that you find in Cubist paintings. Uh, how well you work that, you know, that people like Paul Edouard, who's supposedly a Cubist painter, I've never or a, a poet, I've never bought that. But with yours, I was completely convinced. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you. And I know that we talked, we, you and I talked about the fact that I live in Black Mountain, North Carolina, and my land actually abuts the Black Mountain, the original uh, campus of Black Mountain mm -hmm. College. So there's a lot of connection there with the collage and, and that stuff. I didn't do that. I mean, I, I was working uh, in this kind of writing before I moved here, but, um, it's a really nice serendipitous thing to live so close to Black Mountain. And you're quite lucky for that, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And we have a question uh, from Daniel. Would any of the poets like to tackle the question of when you discovered your poem was taking on its particular form? Yeah. Was it rhyme suggesting a narrative, any sort of moment? So anyone want to address that question? Well, I already answered Daniel in the uh, in the chat, but I'll just tell everybody in case you haven't looked at it. Uh, as it was the line, as soon as I I read the line, averted vision is the deepest vision, perfect iambic pentameter. I I knew this line is so good, it's going to be part of a villanelle. So so it really was the line that that told me what form the uh, the poem had to take. Hmm. I love that your uh, observation about those those lines that in villanelles being gifts. And you think yeah. Got to get this down and see what I can do with it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, wonderful. It seems so. I can I can provide my own little answer to that question. Um, my poem, I actually found the tetrameter A B A B stanza. Um, I was reading a lot of Edwin Arlington Robinson. And his poem, Hillcrest, which I think is one of his underrated ones, I think that might be one of the best poems ever written about being in an artist's colony, of all things. Um, that that poem, I just, I love the way that he inhabited that stanza, and I love the stateliness um, of it. And for some reason, I was thinking a lot about this house, I was thinking about that painting, um, and this house that I live in is over 200 years old um, and I needed something that I I felt like could um, get a sense of that grandeur and, and the weight of the past and uh, it turned out to be just the ticket. Thank you. I, I uh, since we, uh, we talked about Michael's um, uh, over, I was talking about Michael's overlaying of, of ideas and images and co connections and so forth. I was thinking of our first reader, um, Therese uh, Coe's, uh, in the beginning of her story, she talks about the the, the knotted uh, language of the Incas uh, and in her story, how 
there's a weaving of remembrance and idea, uh, but also um, uh, that uh, the different cultures are sort of interwoven on that train uh, and how clever that was to put the knotted language into that story in which there are so many connections, knots and threads. So hats off to you, Therese. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Um, Surprisingly to me, I didn't notice that, but that's really a very interesting point. It really is like um, a weaving of many different uh, international um, types and uh, ethnic groups. And um, I really love being in that kind of a, an environment. Um, I guess I've spent I have not spent all my life in New York, uh, mainly Manhattan, but I've spent the majority of it here, but I've traveled. I've been lucky enough to be able to travel a lot. That's because I spend all my money on travel when I have money. But um, the fact is that Kathmandu was similar when I, uh, when I lived there and was an English teacher in 72, 73, there were young people from all over the world and that made it incredibly interesting, even though the best part of it really was the local people. They were, you know, they are so unusual for 20th, it was the 20th century, for 20th century um, human beings in that they're incredibly ethical and honest and straightforward and open. They're very open and and it's uh, it's quite beautiful. Um, but, you know, the idea that Inca and previous uh, cultural groups in Peru and in the Andes, you know, use these knotted strings of communication, which I've read is only a Generally, it was about, you know, trading and uh, numbers of things they were trading more than anything else. Um, it's, it was fascinating to me. And the people were called rememberers, the ones who could interpret the, the knots, because I guess not everyone could interpret the knots. But maybe some people interpreted them better than others. I don't know. I would just want to add one more thing about that story, which was not in the part that I read, but which really meant a great deal to me, that at some point I found this kind of a slit in the earth that was maybe like um, eight inches wide and longer. And I looked down, it was at a high point at Machu Picchu, and I looked down and it had obviously been there a very long time. And I thought, I wonder if that's an oracle, if it's their or oracle. So I asked you a question. And I actually immediately got an answer, which jumped into my head. I mean, I didn't hear a voice, but the answer jumped into my head. And the question was, well, being a young woman, of course, you know, this is, was the question I asked. I said, who is my soulmate? And the oracle said to me, you've already met him. Which, you know, it really made me think maybe there really is an oracle here because I would not have thought of that. And I would not have answered the question that way. I was hoping for like this person, that person, but it said, I already met him. So then I had another, you know, I, I wasn't going to push my luck and ask a, a second question, but I just decided, okay, I think I know. I think I know who they mean. They. <laughs> now I'm calling it that. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that, whatever. But that was my favorite moment up there. Thanks so much, Therese. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all I all I was going to say was that I detect from the voices 
that I may be the only Brit here. And so I just... No, you're not an essay also. <laughs> uh, so I just thank you also. Say, thank you, so thank, you, thank you, everyone. And I was have, of course, my favorite bit of the evening. And of course, I'm not going to say which it was because I want to applaud everyone. So here's my applause. Thank you <laughs> and good night. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Um, so um, let's see, uh, going back to gallery. Uh, I invite all of the uh, writers to put in information in the chat box about uh, where they can, where, uh, where the audience can find their work. Uh, and uh, I am holding up the issue as uh, Alex did. Am I there? No. Yes. Alex did at the beginning. Um, and um, welcome everyone to uh, submit to the Wright Prize for um, uh, the Able Muse Wright Prize for Poetry, Prose, and the Book Award, um, and uh, which is open now and will be open until mid July. Mid no, no, sorry, not mid July, sorry, till the uh, end of uh, March. End of March, the uh, 15 March, 15 March for right price for poetry and fiction, and the end of uh, March for the book award. The book and book. also, while while I'm mentioning this, uh, the new issue of Able Muse is accepting submissions now. So that's for everyone, uh, both uh, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, art, and reviews. So and that also you can find out how to submit at ablemuse.com. So uh, our editors are reading uh, submissions now and they usually respond within a few days. So just uh, go there and submit if you have some, if you want to be in the new issue coming up uh, at the end of the year. Thank you, Alex. And it, it that is open until the 31st of uh, July. Yeah, that's, no, uh, 15 of, of July, 15. Yeah. Oh, the 15th of July. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. And